for those of you who don't uh, know me. And uh, I want to talk about uh, freedom and constraint in uh, Jonathan Franzen's novel today. And um, yeah, just as a sort of warning, I don't really have much of a conclusion. I kind of fade out, so I thought you could help me. Um, structure the essay a bit and uh, maybe tell me where I should go from here or what's interesting and what's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. So, okay. Uh, Jonathan Franzen's 2010 novel interrogates the meanings of the word freedom, that most American of tropes. It is very much a novel informed by larger events such as the terror attacks of 9 11 and American political and cultural responses to them. If the corrections, so Franz's previous novel, if the corrections, which was published just days before the attacks, is the realist novel of the American family life pre September 11, Freedom, uh, the, the latest novel by Franz, or, yeah, uh, Freedom investigates the same subject in light of changed circumstances, the American family during the war on terror. Thus, Franz's novel, although often funny and written in a prose that reads quickly, almost addictively, um, aspires to lofty goals. It seeks to be the great American novel by addressing the key concerns of modern life in the United States. So, uh, family, love, friendship, and culture, uh, especially music, but also work, politics, and environmentalism. These last three aspects are transnational, and more so in 2010 than in, than in any other time in the past. Seen this way, the scope of Franz's novel is amazingly broad. It is over 500 pages long, but one feels it could go on indefinitely. Um, in this, it is similar, depending on how much you like it, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in this, it is similar to texts such as David Foster Wallace's uh, Infinite Jest, in that they both uh, attempt uh, comprehensiveness. Okay. Um, right. Good. So, Franzen's uh, neo realist novel fits well into Barth's uh, category of the readerly which attempts to close off meanings. So one can, one can imagine some of the same topics being addressed in a more writerly fashion, such as in uh, Don DeLillo's White Noise. Uh, this article, or this, this, this talk I'm giving, uh, this, this talk addresses the interplay of freedom and constraint on two levels, uh, plot and style. So um, the events of the novel, the descriptions of what the characters feel and think, can be conceived as investigating the pools of freedom and constraint. So the style of the novel is uh, firmly realist. It is a prose which seeks to preclude what Bart, what Bacht, uh, Bacht, what Bacht called the free play of signifiers. Franzen's, te Franzen's text constrains meaning and offers readers little freedom uh, in construing multiple or even idiosyncratic interpretation, uh, interpretations. Um, yeah. When Freedom was published, there was a broad consensus uh, of interpretation of its main themes. The first, this occurred first in book reviews and op-eds, and these were later echoed by academic work. The title was understood to be an allusion to Bush-era propaganda. For example, in Bush's address to the nation on September 20th, 2011, uh, sorry, 2001, uh, he used the word 13 times. In an interview with the Paris Review, Franzen was quite explicit, quote, The propaganda of the Bush administration, its appropriation of words like freedom for cynical, short-term political gain, was a clear and present danger. Let's take one of those buzzwords, freedom, and try to restore it to its problematic glory, end quote. That's a fair assessment of the novel's plot, and it was indeed read in this way, um, in reviews by uh, David Brooks or with Franklin, and academic criticism alike. Uh, Weinstein is more of an, on, the, on the academic side, concludes his review with the observation that, quote, at its core, freedom reveals that the only freedom we possess and hears and how we negotiate are endless arrays of constraints. Franzen's humor and humanity derive uh, from the terrifying truth in our face all the time, but evaded no less insistently that our freedom and unfreedom are constitutive dimensions of each other. If freedom is an important, if not the most important, value in American life, then Franz's novel explores the term in the gritty reality of the day-to-day. -day. Though the title is overtly political, the novel is not, at least, not at first glance. It hews strongly to the family and to intimate relationships. 
Freedom is on display, but the motor of the plot is the unhappiness caused by freedom. From sexual freedom comes shame and guilt. From freedom to move around the country at ease uh, flows a loss of community. From freedom to choose a career and do anything with one's time comes depression and an unwillingness to do any work at all. Freedom is, as Walter Berglund, so he's one of the, the main characters, as Walter Berglund um, sums it up in a moment of frustration, the freedom to self-destruct. So I've got the, the quote here. Right. So this is Walter's uh, rant about freedom. Um, it's all circling around the same problem of personal liberties. People came to this country for either money or freedom. If you don't have money, you clean your freedoms all the more angrily. Even if smoking kills you, even if you can't afford to feed your kids, even if your kids are getting shot down by maniacs with assault rifles. You may be poor, but the one thing nobody can take away from you is the freedom to fuck up your life whatever way you want to. That's what Bill Clinton figured out, that we can't win elections by running against personal liberties, especially not against guns, actually. So this, this is a quote from, from, from Freedom, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, entertaining novel. I hope that comes across in my presentation. Okay, good. So, um, the downsides of freedom are apparent in the opening pages of Franzen's text, and they form a clear pattern as the novel progresses, uniting disparate plot elements. The opening of the novel describes Walter and Patty as young gentrifiers raising a family in St. Paul. Yet for all Patty's focus on raising her children and making a home, she is oddly cut off from her own parents. She also has no connection to New York, where she has grown up, or any friends or extended family. Quote, One strange thing about Patty, given her strong family orientation, was that she had no discernible connection to her roots. Whole seasons passed without her ever setting foot outside, setting foot outside St. Paul. And it wasn't clear to anybody that anybody from the East, not even her parents, had ever come to visit, in quote. So, Patty's embrace of radical freedom, the freedom to leave your home, to start over, to forget one's roots, flowers evilly when she becomes depressed and destroys her marriage and her home life. The flip side of Patty's initial freedom is that there are no structures to catch her when she falls. The constraints of family and friends, career and community, have been brushed aside. She alienates her children when she smothers them, attempting to fill gaps in her own life by treating her children as friends and confidants. She then throws herself into a destructive affair with her husband's best friend. A passage from Patty's diary, which is interwoven throughout the third-person narration in the novel, reads, quote, uh, this is Patty writing about herself, Quote, it should be clear by now that her capacity for error, agonizing, and self-humiliation is boundless. Good. Um, the topic of freedom and constraint determines the plot events of almost all the main characters. When uh, Walter Berglund's and Patty's husband, when Walter attempts to save a species of warbler instead of type of bird, he constantly runs into pushback by West Virginia residents and the economic interests of the coal companies. Indeed, the topic of freedom and constraint is perhaps at its most pertinent when one considers environmentalism. Uh, the plot lines that follow the actions of Richard Katz, the man with whom Patty has had an affair, uh, and Joey's son are also pushed forward by an unhappiness that springs from radical freedom. Absent the Frenzen's work is any positive alternative model to American freedom. The ham-handed, one-dimensional freedom of Bush's speech to the nation after 9-11 is never countered by another conception. It is only endlessly problematized in various plot lines as through a mirror darkly and refracted infinitely. Of course, many negative aspects of American freedom were sketched out long ago in the frontier thesis. Frederick Jackson Turner famously claimed that, quote, the frontier is productive of individualism, of individualism. Complex society Complex society is precipitated by the wilderness into a kind of primitive organization based on the family. The tendency is antisocial. It produces antipathy to control, and particularly to any direct control, end quote. Francis' characters, living in an era of post-frontier, so the Western frontier, the end of the space race, the triumph of capitalism, democracy, and the West, um, they are exposed to all the negatives of frontier culture without these being balanced by the positives of actually having wilderness, of actually having a frontier. It is, this, it is as if all the fallout incurred by the closing of the frontier prophesied by Frederick Jackson Turner had come to pass. Francis' characters live in an America which does not provide, quote, a gate of escape from the bondage of the past, quote. And there is no, quote, 
freshness and confidence in its scorn of older society. So those are all quotes from Frederick Jackson. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> so Rousseau's notion of freedom as expressed in the social contract does, however, form an interesting foil to Franzen's and Bush's conceptions of freedom. In uh, Du Contrat Social, uh, Rousseau immediately invokes the social as key to understanding freedom. And Rousseau says, uh, L'ordre social est un droit sacré qui sert de base à tous les autres. So, like the social order, it's a, it's a sacred right which serves as the base to all other rights. They all devolve from this, uh, from this sacred right. So, this contrasts uh, to the individualistic lone settler idea of American freedom, prominent in text such as Frederick Jackson Turner's landmark essay on the subject. In Rousseau, freedom is expressed mainly in terms of subjugation to society. Indeed, it is only by abandoning natural freedom. Uh, that exists in the state of nature, that people can access other more profound freedoms. So these are civil, democratic, and moral. Uh, Matthew Simpson, he's a, he's a Rousseau scholar, has summed up Rousseau's thought, drawing mostly from the social contract, but also from Emile and the Second Discourse, arguing, quote, everyone in the state of nature is a slave, in the sense of not being a moral agent and not possessing moral freedom. Thus, there's reason to say that moral freedom is the most important kind of freedom that the political society, society offers, because it changes the kind of being that humanity is, making it morally significant, and so apart from and above the rest of nature, in quote. So, a Rousseauian reading of Friends' novel would be that the lone settler uh, libertarian tendencies in America, they pull individuals away from uh, higher level freedoms. A turn away from the community implies an embrace of the mirage of freedom. To reject society means a limiting of the human, an inability to grasp our civil, democratic, and moral freedoms that are integral to our cultural heritage and separate us from other animals. If the Americans of Francis' novel are everywhere in chains, it is so because they have been told that their chains are the essence of freedom. In this slide, Bush's uh, post-9-11 panegyric of freedom reads more like a maxim from, or the maxim from Orwell's 1984, Freedom is Slavery. Rousseau's key insight was that brute force can never lead to the establishment of rights. So Rousseau says, Céder à la force est un acte de nécessité, non de volonté. C'est tout au plus un acte de prudence. En quel sens pourrait-ce être un devoir so it's um, so to 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 give in to a force is an act of necessity, not of will. It is at most an act of prudence. So how could this, this giving in to a force, uh, be considered a right? Instead, rights only f flow from one's voluntary submission to a social body. Still, there is a constant tension in Rousseau about the different kinds of freedom: civil, democratic, and moral. Once people have rejected natural freedom and entered into the social contract. For Rousseau, civic freedom meant that citizens were free to live their lives without coercion from the state or from other individuals. Democratic freedom is the power of citizens to, uh, to rule themselves uh, or to vote for their leaders. And the last freedom, this, this moral freedom, uh, means that one can act according to his or her own, to, to, to his or her own conscience. One can make two contradictory arguments about friends and freedom with Rousseau in mind. One, that its characters choose civic freedom in detriment to moral freedom. So Patty considers acts, sorry, Patty constantly acts in ways that are allowed by the state and others, but that contradict her own moral compass. This is also exactly the sense that Walter articulates, saying that freedom is the freedom to destroy one's life without interference. They cannot really be said to possess moral freedom, like in, in Rousseau's sense, for characters consistently act in ways abhorrent to their own consciousnesses. Two, so the second point, uh, that Franzen's characters reject the social contract outright and long for a return to natural freedom. The globalized, rootless, atheist, American, upper middle class that Franzen writes about, they have, shed, they have shredded the social contract beyond anything that Rousseau could have possibly imagined. Even though Rousseau envisioned the state of nature as being before the social contract, the state of nature in France comes after the social contract, so after we have shredded the contract. 
to friends in the sexual world as then post social contact. Right. Of course, in the American context, uh, one of the most influential theorists of freedom is John Stuart Mill. Mill, like Rousseau, immediately grounds his notion of liberty in the social and political. Quote, the nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. Quote. The two most important aspects of liberty for Mill are, one, the constraints of the state. So liberty is a check on the power of the rulers, be they monarchical or elected, right? And this is also the sense of liberty you find in the Magna Carta. This is what a, this is what a, a prince is not allowed to do. So that's, that's, that's the first point for me. Uh, the second is the division of powers, and this is effectively the um, checks and balances system of the U.S. government. Mill's version of utilitarianism, his views on free speech and liberty, provide foundation, foundational texts for government and for intellectual and, and cultural traditions, especially in Anglo-American contexts. What is striking and important considering Franzen's texts is that Mill consistently advocated for, living, for liberty as a happiness maximizer, both on an individual and societal level. He argued that the best society, that so he argued that the best society should be so structured as to that people do decide for themselves with the fewest constraints possible. Um, so this is a quote from On, on, on Liberty. Um, the sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do or forbear because it would be better for him to do so, because it would make him happier, because in the opinion of others, to do so would be wise or even right. The only part of the conduct for anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. In the part which merely concerns him, his independence is of right absolute. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. Because Franzen's text emphasizes the pain and guilt that come from limitless freedom, it inverts Mill's thought. For Mill, the maximizing of liberty and minimizing of restraints will eventually lead to the greatest good for the greatest number. And, if this is not immediately apparent, the arc will eventually bend towards eudaimonia, which means happiness. Freedom shows uh, that arc bending in the opposite direction and seems to long for some restraint, so regional, environmental, or sexual. Uh, that would hold people in check and produce better results for society and the, the, the individual. Francis' text is in opposition to Mills as it is in opposition to Rousseau. This is because of the postmodern context of American life in 2019. So modern Americans are free from constraints so much so as to be unintelligible to Mill and to Rousseau. They are free from tradition, religion, region, and family to an extent unimaginable uh, to 18th and 19th century thinkers. Good. Um, so far, we've seen how Franzen's neorealist novel draws negative inspiration uh, from Bush's post 9 11 speech, and we've sketched out uh, the novel's version of freedom in contrast to Rousseau and Timo. So I'd like now to turn to what's, what's not discussed uh, in Franzen's text uh, the issue of free will. So this sort of has to do with uh, Rousseauian, like moral. Uh, moral uh, freedom, but it's, it's a little bit different, so that's why I chose a different theorist. Uh, on the surface, freedom does not at all, this is the novel, freedom does not at all address the notion of free will, but this seems to me at any rate an integral part of the topic of freedom and constraint. Debates uh, by philosophers on the topic of free will, such as Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett, take as their starting point the fact that free will is popularly understood as false. The two popular uh, conceptions of free will that philosophers agree on as being erroneous are, firstly, that we could have behaved other than we did in the past, and then secondly, that we are the conscious source of most of our thoughts and actions in the present. Good. Um, philosophically speaking, there, there are three approaches to the problem of free will. There's determinism, libertarianism, this is no connection to the American political philosophy, this is this is something else, so this is just about free will. Determinism, libertarianism, and compatibilism. 
Determinists hold that free will is an illusion as our behavior is fully formed by background causes. Libertarianism also embraces, also embraces determinism, but makes an exception in this one case of free will. Right? So they are determinists too, but they just think that free will is something different. Libertarians believe that free will, uh, to quote Harris, magically rises above the plane of physical causation. End quote. Almost all philosophers today who argue for the existence of free will are compatibilists, like, like, like Daniel Dennett. Compatibilists believe that we live in a deterministic universe, but they stretch the conception of the person as an active decider to embrace factors like genes, background causes, and the uncertainty in quantum theory. Indeed, compatibilists contort their, their concept of personhood so much so as to be unrecognizable for most people uh, who say they believe in free will. And this is the crux of Harris's and Dennett's argument. Uh, Sam Harris is a determinist. He rejects popular notions of free will, arguing that it is only a felt experience. If we were somehow to turn back time, any decision we have made we would make again and again, exactly the same way. Any decision, whether made lightly or after lengthy deliberation, uh, will be made in exactly the same manner, no matter how many times we, re we rewind the tape, so to speak. So free will is only an apparent phenomenon. It feels as if one could have chosen differently, but this is not the case. Uh, most of the contention between philosophers such as Harris and Dennett circles around the concept of the rational decider. Harris takes the more radical position that we never rationally decide anything because we're not the author of our thoughts or where they come from, he asks. And that influences like environment, genes, and upbringing have made us so who we are that there's no room left for independent, clean slaves, ultra-rational deciders. So, we are always pushed in some direction by these factors that are essentially out of our control. The example Harris uses is that of a man with a brain tumor who commits a crime. He is not held responsible, legally or morally, for this crime because of his illness. Harris argues that all people should be considered in the same light as being not fundamentally responsible for their actions. According to Harris, one still uh, would have punishment for crime because deterrence remained effective, but the whole notion of guilt and blame uh, evaporated. So uh, Daniel Dennett, um, a compatibilist, he challenges Harris only insofar as to say that these external factors, uh, genes, environment, and upbringing, that they constitute the self. Dennett holds that when one makes decisions, one both rationally and irrationally makes them. We can still say that a person is responsible for his or her actions. We, cons we consciously and unconsciously choose, and this mode of being and choosing is what constitutes being a person. For Harris, these factors are outside of the self. So even when Dennett allows for free will, it is by employing a notion of the self that is so at odds with the, with the self as popularly understood that it almost negates his argument. It's interesting that this notion of the self simmers just below the surface in Jonathan Franzen's freedom. The characters are constantly analyzing their decision-making process and bemoaning the fact that it occurred under the influence of strong emotions such as depression, uh, or legal drugs, or psychopharmaceuticals, or, or, or hormone adult craving for sex, or a desire to validate oneself vis-a-vis -vis one's parents. The list could be expanded almost infinitely. This observation is reinforced linguistically when one considers the title of Patty's autobiography. It's called Mistakes Were Made. The passive voice and elision of the acting subjects uh, of the acting subject puts the focus on the deeds and not on the doer. Even Patty's plunge into adultery occurs when she sleepwalks, she's not really sleepwalking, she's just she is, when she sleepwalks into Richard's room, telling him that everything will be okay because she's not really awake. <laughs> and so, I'll quote that, the novel is hilarious when you read this, I really can't do it justice, but I will. Uh, so, the so quote from the novel is, I'm asleep, you get to sleep too, you fall asleep, we'll both be asleep, and then I'll be gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, Patty is awake, and the sleepwalking is just a pathetic and childish attempt to deny reality, just as saying mistakes were made, Patty's quote, um, is a somewhat lame device to ward off her gnawing guilt. This theme becomes explicit in an argument between Patty and her husband Walter, when Patty constantly employs the passive voice as if she were divorced from her own actions, and Walter angrily corrects her, stating that she was there, actively choosing, and that she must bear responsibility. 
So um, Patty says, uh, I'm so sorry this happened. And then Walter says, it didn't happen, you did it. Yeah. Um, this is so in case after case in freedom. The text makes clear that though many factors affect decision making, that the person is always responsible. Yeah. The person actively chooses and thus bears full responsibility with all the guilt and blame that this entails. Other models are possible, but this is the one embraced and repeated with almost infinite uh, variety in Francis' text. So definitely like the, the libertarian uh, mode of thinking about free will. Okay. Um, one can apply these situations to the debate above. Following Harris's line of argument, one could make decisions without uh, external influences, so environmental, psych psychopharmaceutical. Uh, one is never, sorry, let me read that last sentence again. Following Harris's line of argument, even if one could make decisions without external influences so from the environment, from psychopharmaceuticals, one is never the author of one's own, one's, own thought, one's own thoughts. We are children of parents who did not choose. Born into a time and place that are, again, not of our choosing. We are always drug adult, so to speak, always pre-influenced uh, in a way that precludes any talk of a decision that is completely our own, completely free of entanglements. Take away free will and quote, the place for our blames from the advantages, end quote. Uh, that's, that's quoting Sam Harris's book again. Um, Harris's determinism thus stands in direct opposition to freedom's libertarianism. Uh, so, pop, so philosophically, um, it's out of fashion, but in uh, popular culture and novels, this libertarianism is uh, alive and well. <laughs> freedom is a novel about Patty's guilt over the choice to be unfaithful, the guilt that stands at the center of freedom and that drives many plot uh, events forward appears illogical when considering uh, Harris's argument. According to Harris, guilt arises because of the illusion of free will. It does make sense, according to Harris, to use carrot and stick methods to try to alter someone's behavior. But to hate or blame someone for their actions is akin to hating or blaming an animal for its actions. So Francis' novel problematizes Bush's nationalistic take on the term freedom, and at the same time, the text displays the immense psychic pain that results in attachments to popular notions of free will prevalent in modern American culture. In Harris's terms, uh, Patty's focus on the self conceals the fact that she is not in charge of her own thoughts or actions. Patty's unhappiness springs from a focus on a fixed self and from her inability to see people as a series of interlocking processes. Okay, I just have one more quote because I'm a McCarthy guy, I've got to bring him in somewhere, so we've got to talk a little bit uh, about McCarthy and, 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 I'll, and I'll be done. Okay. If uh, if debates on free will remain resolutely below the surface in Friends and Freedom, they take center stage in many texts by Cormac McCarthy, just to give a contrasting example. Uh, Anton Chigurh, the murderous anti-hero of No Country for Old Men, says as much in dialogue with one of his victims. Chigurh denies rational agency and describes a world that is totally deterministic. His creepy power as the text villain derives from his complete submission to this determinism. Before murdering his victim, he gives her the opportunity of a coin toss to save herself, which she, of course, uh, loses. Good, so Shikur, Shikur then says, um, I wish I could read this like Javier Bardem, but I can't, so you're gonna have to imagine that, that I can't. So, so the Shikur character says, I got here the same way the coin did. I had no say in the matter. Every moment in your life is a turn and everyone will choose you. Somewhere you made a choice, all followed to this. The accounting is scrupulous, the shape is wrong. No line can be erased. I had no belief in your ability to move a coin to do your bidding. How could you? A person's path through the world seldom changes, and even more seldom will it change abruptly. And the shape of your path was visible from the beginning. You can say that things could not have turned out differently, that they could have been some other way. But what does that mean? They are not some other way, they are this way. You're asking that I second say the world, do you see? 
Um, the, the, the division between McCarthy and Friendly is really not that clear, but Friendly is really addressing these issues. Uh, sorry, McCarthy is really addressing these issues of determinism in a way I think is really interesting, and in a way that Friendly really sidesteps, doesn't doesn't do anything. So this foregrounding of a deterministic worldview finds echo in other McCarthy texts as well, such as all the pretty courses in Blood Meridian. It forms an interesting counterpole to Franzen's text, which wallows in guilt and emphasizes choice and a longing that one could have chosen otherwise. Uh, so okay. um, and a longing that one could have chosen otherwise. McCarthy critics have long noticed this deterministic tendency in many of his texts, comparing humans to animals, or sometimes complaining that they have virtually no thoughts. McCarthy's rejection of free will is as palpable of Franz as Franzen's embrace of it. Um, okay, I just wanted to put some of the, uh, the main uh, topics that I, that I talked about as uh, a final slide. And I, I told you that this was a, a work in progress and I, 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 cut, I cut a bunch. And um, as, a, as, a, as a final question, I was trying to write something about the relationship between, between aesthetic modes, so Franz's neo-realism, neo and then free will to take it one step further. But I, I'm not sure it, it makes sense, and I ran out of time anyways, but I wanted to ask a question without being able to answer it. Yeah. Okay, good. That, that's all I got to say. Thanks, thanks a lot for listening.